So I'm going to get started with today's uh, uh, presentation, and it is entitled right. The Matrix Trilogy Can Hold. <laughs> what is a matrix? What are the matrix movies? The matrix movies are, yes, science fiction stories, but what they really are are allegories. So this term really has to be understood if every, every, anyone is not familiar with it. An allegory is a story, poem, or picture that can be interpreted to reveal a hidden or a coded meaning. What we're going to be doing here is decrypting that message. We're going to decode that message and show you what it's really about. What this science fiction trilogy is really about is our world, what's going on in our world. And an allegory uh, typically teaches a moral or a political lesson of some kind. So the allegory of the matrix is actually about our world being under complete control. It's about the control system that is already in place in our world that we're already living in. And it's controlled by hidden forces or occult forces. It is an allegory about how this planet is being turned into a prison society. And that we're already really living in that prison society and are largely unaware of that fact. Or at least the bulk of humanity is unaware of that fact. The people in this room are most certainly aware of it. But the good news about the matrix of the, uh, the allegory of the matrix trilogy is that it also shows us the key. It shows us how we can get out of that prison society that has been built up all around us. So each movie answers a different question. The first movie answers the question, what is the matrix? When they're talking about, quote unquote, the matrix, what is that? What do they mean by that? And that's what the entire first movie gets into. The second movie answers the question, why are we in the matrix? What are the causal factors that led to this condition? And I would suggest that this is why the second movie is wildly unpopular in comparison to the first movie. For people who can see the control system, at least, they are, and are not resistant to at least seeing the controls in place in our world, they're still very resistant to understanding why that control system is in place and what's perpetuating it. And most unpopular of all is the third film, because the third film answered the question, how do we get out of the matrix? And that's the information that people are actually the most resistant to hearing, because that involves deep internal change in, one, in a person's thoughts, emotions, and actions. And that's the thing that they're the most resistant to. So that's why I would suggest the second and third movie did not nearly gain the traction of the first movie. So let's start in and take a look at the first movie, which, is, which answers the question, what is the Matrix? The film begins in a hotel called the heart of the city. So it's starting at the heart. This is very highly symbolic, as we will see, because people look up. One of the things people miss in this movie is that it begins and ends in the same place, in the heart. OK, it, it, it actually comes around full circle and Neo actually ends up in this building at the end of the film. OK, so. Every movie, every one of the movies also begins with Trinity, the main female lead, played by Carrie Ann Moss, in distress, in severe distress of some kind. Each movie starts with her under attack or in distress, okay? Because she represents the feminine force that is in distress in our world, okay? She's under attack by agents at the beginning of the first film. Agents of the state are what these agents in the matrix represent. They represent people who are doing the bidding of the control system. Okay, the main hero of the film, played by Keanu Reeves, is Thomas Anderson, who is a software engineer. Okay, now, the matrix is all an allegory dealing with software jargon, uh, computer jargon, okay, software, hardware, uh, internet, things like that. So. Another thing a lot of people miss is that at the beginning of every film, the first time you ever see the main character, he is asleep. Every film, okay? And this is suggestive 
This is suggestive that we are asleep because Thomas Anderson represents the every man. He is us. Okay? He represents our position as the average human being trapped in the matrix and asleep. Okay? Not having awoken yet. And he receives an encrypted message on his computer that says, wake up, Neo. See, that's his hacker name, Neo. We'll get into what that represents, the name. The matrix has you. It owns you. Okay? And follow the white rabbit is the advice he's given. And that's suggestive, of course, Lewis Carroll's uh, Through the Looking Glass, which is also about a, a reality that is hidden from our view. So his apartment is room 101. Now, this is a direct reference to 1984, the book by George Orwell. And room 101 in that film represents the place where your deepest fears are contained that you have to go into, that, that the, 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 the protagonist of that movie had to go into near the end of the book, uh, I'm sorry, the book, 1984 had to go into, and, you know, unfortunately that movie has a very dark ending where The Matrix actually has a quite hopeful ending. But uh, Room 101 represents fear, and you see the one-eye symbolism as well here, with the, the character peeking out fearfully through the door. This is a scene where a bunch of uh, uh, other uh, hacker types come to his house to, to take some uh, code, take some stolen information from Neo, who he has paid uh, a couple thousand dollars for at the beginning of the film. Now, the money stash that he uses is a book. It's a hollowed out book. But this book is actually what inspired the film. Okay? It's a real book. It's by Jean Baudrillard. Okay? And it's called Simulacra and Simulation. And it is a book about how we are lost in the map and we are not even seeing the territory for what it is. It's a book about how our perceptions are completely misguided and we are misled into a dream world. And we're believing that the symbols and the map are the real world and we're not even really paying attention to the real world. We're not paying attention to nature at all. Okay? So that's what that book is all about. I suggest people check it out because it is really... Uh, along with uh, some other spiritual teaching from different traditions, what the, uh, what the information underlies the Matrix films. Now, the people who show up to give him the money, uh, one of their girlfriends has this white rabbit on her shoulder. So you see synchronicity, the idea of synchronicity being injected into the film. He was just told, follow the white rabbit, a white rabbit appears. He decides to go along with that, stepping into the stream of synchronicity, and that leads him to a club where he meets Trinity, where uh, Neo, Thomas Anderson, meets Trinity. Now, he never met her before, but he was aware of her reputation. Here's part of the conversation that takes place. Trinity says, I know why you're here, Neo. You're looking for him. I know because I was once looking for the same thing. And when he found me, he told me I wasn't really looking for him. I was looking for an answer. It's the question that drives us mad. It's the question that brought you here. You know the question just as I did. And Neo replies, what is the matrix? That is the question that we're going to get an answer to. Trinity says, the answer is out there, Neo. It's looking for you, and it will find you if you want it to. So this is suggestive that the desire for truth must be present if we're going to find answers. And... Uh, the person she's referring to, of course, is Morpheus, who we'll get to in a moment. But Morpheus represents the truth teller. He represents the one who is revealing the truth and helping to bring people out of the matrix. So, um, the next slide is from Thomas Anderson's Place of Employment, which is a software company. And his boss, Reinhardt, says to him that he has a problem with authority. Because that's what this movie is about. Authority... Uh, being projected onto us and us believing in it, us accepting the notion that there's such a thing as authority in human form. And he says, I'll read part of the, the dialogue. He says, you have a problem with authority, Mr. Anderson. You believe that you are special, that somehow the rules don't apply to you. Obviously, you're mistaken. This company is one of the top software companies in the world because every single employee understands that they are part of a whole. So he's emphasizing the concept of collectivism, 
of giving yourself over to the collective instead of expressing your uniqueness and individuality. And he concludes by saying, thus, if an employee has a problem, the company has a problem. So, agents of the state show up to question Neo, and he doesn't know why they're there. So he's on the phone uh, with Morpheus, and Morpheus says to him, I have been looking for you. I don't know if you're ready to see what I want to show you, suggesting that most people aren't ready. They're resistant. They don't want to see the truth. Okay? He says, but unfortunately, you and I have run out of time. And that's where we're at. We're at the time where it's no longer time to sugarcoat this information. We have to get it out there whether people are ready to hear it or not. So they come for, these agents of the state come for Neo, doesn't know why they want him, and they bring him to a holding center uh, to interrogate him. So they're trying to inject him with fear and, you know, bully him and, uh, you know, basically make him afraid. And one of the strangest scenes in the movie, one of the agents is able to actually make his lips melt together and silence him. And this suggests that what the agents of the state really want is to silence us. They don't want us speaking out. They want us afraid, and they want us quiet. Afraid and quiet. And that would be playing into their hands. We have to speak up now more than ever. Also, they bug him. They hold him down, and they put an electronic bug in his navel. Okay? And what this is suggested of is they're trying to keep you in fear that they're always listening to you. Oh, I can't post this on Facebook. It's under surveillance. I can't talk about this on the Internet. They'll listen to what I'm saying. Well, shed all of that fear. Come out, speak the truth. If you're standing in the truth, nothing's ultimately going to stand in your way. I want the agents of the state to hear what I have to say because maybe they'll learn something. All right. So that fear needs to be shed. So he finally meets Morpheus. Again, Morpheus in Greek mythology represents the god of dreams. He is revealing the dream. That's what Morpheus actually means. Okay? And this is a famous meeting between Morpheus, Trinity, and Neo. And Trinity brings them together. Trinity, who represents our emotions, brings our action, which is the will, which is what Neo represents, into alignment with thought, which is what Morpheus represents. So let's take a look at these three characters and what they really represent allegorically. They are different aspects of our consciousness, of the expression of our consciousness. And uh, Neo represents, well, I'll start with Morpheus. Our consciousness, the expression of our consciousness is composed of three modalities or dynamics, our thoughts, our emotions, and our actions. These are the three ways we express our consciousness. Uh, Morpheus represents the mind. He is the thoughts aspect of consciousness. So he is the mind. He is our intelligence. When we use the mind, we're gaining knowledge. We're making a connection with truth. That's what Morpheus represents. That which is going to show us the truth. Okay? Trinity is the spirit. She is the sacred feminine, the heart, our compassion, love energy. That's what she represents. And again, she acts as the bridge between the two. The heart is the bridge between our mind and our will. The heart is the center. Thank you. Our actions is represented by Neo. He is the will. He represents courage. He represents the exercise of conscience, doing that which we know to be right. And he represents our desire for freedom, for true freedom. Okay? So he is the will. When they meet, finally, when the thoughts reach out to the actions, to the will, and they finally meet in the Lafayette Hotel, Morpheus presents Neo with a choice. And here's how the dialogue goes. Morpheus says, you're here because you know something. What you know you can't explain, but you feel it. You felt it your entire life. That there is something wrong with the world. You don't know what it is, but it is there, like a splinter in your mind driving you mad. It is this feeling that has brought you to me. Do you know what I'm talking about? And Neo replies, the Matrix. Morpheus says, 
Do you want to know what it is? You want to know what the matrix is? The matrix is everywhere. It's all around us, even now in this very room. You can see it when you look out your window, when you go to church. Oh, I'm sorry, when you turn on your television. You can feel it when you go to work, when you go to church, when you pay your taxes. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. And Neo asks, what truth? And Morpheus replies that, that you are a slave, slave, Neo. Yes. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage, you born bad. into a prison that you can't taste or smell or taste or touch, a prison for your mind. Unfortunately, no one can be told what the Matrix is. You have to see it for yourself. So this is the idea that we have to have our mind on it, not to see the system of control that is all around us. No one can really explain it to us. We have to be open-minded enough to see it for ourselves. He says, this is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill and the story ends here. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. If you take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland, and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Another reference to through the looking glass. And this is suggestive that the, the truth, to understand the truth, is a choice that only we can make. And the frequencies represented by the two colored pills are something that is a, a part of the code of this allegory. See, blue frequencies are about passing. It's about passive energy, okay? And that means if you don't want the truth, you would be shifting toward the blue frequency field. Red is about pushing forward and engaging the will and going wherever the truth leads, okay? It's the masculine aspect, which is what we have to engage when it comes to the acceptance of the truth. We have to employ will to, uh, to understand what is really going on in our world. So that's why he has to take the red pill and not take the blue pill. He has to accept the truth and move forward with it to go where it leads as opposed to pass on. That's what that represents. Okay, so of course the main character, our hero, Neo, takes the red pill. Uh, before he takes the red pill, Morpheus finally says, remember, all I'm offering is the truth, suggesting that it is not going to be a pleasant experience, because understanding the truth isn't a pleasant experience. Okay, now the movie starts moving very fast from the point where he takes the red pill. And after he takes it, the regular world around him dissolves, it goes away, okay? And he wakes up in a horror-filled world. And that's what learning the truth is like. You're, all of the, your illusions that you previously believed are falling away, and now you're waking up to the horror of our reality, okay? He wakes up in a pod of like gelatinous goo connected with all kinds of tubes and machines all in his flesh. And this is about that the system has its hooks in us. It has its hooks in every part of us. And we need to shed those hooks. We need to purge ourselves of them. Okay? And when he looks around, for as far as the eye can see in every direction, there's human beings in these pods, still completely unconscious and in this, in this total machine system that's feeding off of their energy. Okay? When he looks down, it's as far as the eye can see, like a gigantic cow where you can't even see the bottom, you can't even see the top. It goes, it seemingly extends forever. And this is the horror of our situation, that we live in a world of people who are so connected to no aspect of reality whatsoever. They still completely engage in, accept and believe the illusion that is projected at them by the mainstream media, the government, religion, etc. People are not in connection with truth, they're in connection with fantasy land, and they are all around us for as far as the eye can see. That is our actual situation. So the characters uh, uh, who are on Morpheus, Morpheus's ship finally rescue Neo. He gets ejected out a, uh, a, um, uh, waste, a waste shaft, and um, he's picked up, and he's brought on board the hovercraft of Morpheus and the other characters. Um, the, more, the hovercraft is called the Nebuchadnezzar. And they bring him on board this hovercraft, and he's in complete, he's, he's a wreck. They have to rebuild his muscles, because he's never actually really moved his own muscles. He's lived in this pod. He's been grown 
like a plant instead of live his life like a human being. And in a pot his whole life, so his muscles have atrophied. This represents the weakness that we're in when we first start waking up, when we first start coming out of delusion, okay? That we have to build ourselves back up because it's like, you know, throwing someone a weight whose muscles have atrophied. They're not going to be able to catch it. They're not going to be strong. You know, when they're first, you know, starting to use their muscles, you know, they're just, you know, getting their legs under them. So it, ha it has to be taken slow in a stepwise progression to give people uh, information when they're first coming out of the matrix. So he asked the question at one point when they're doing this work on his body, why do my eyes hurt? And Morpheus answers, because you've never used them before. So he's telling you, you've never seen the world for what it really is. You've never really opened your eyes. You've never really used your own eyes. You know, you've been buying into the illusions all around you. And you've never seen the world as it really is for yourself. Okay? So that's what that part represents. So... Morpheus explains to him that they're on a hovercraft and they have computer technology there that allows them to jack into the matrix and, and uh, broadcast a pirate signal, which allows them to project their consciousness into the machine's programming. We'll, we'll understand what that is as we get into the story of what happened on the Earth in the movie, okay? But basically, these are the machines that they jack into the matrix through. And here you see them, he's putting Neo into one of these machines, and he's going to show him uh, one of their programs that they call the Construct, which is their, their loading and training program, okay? So this is the Construct that he takes him into, and they can project any kind of uh, scenario that they want for training or, or learning purposes. And it's, you know, it makes the mind experiences it, experience this as if it were real, but they're actually in a computer-generated reality. So Morpheus says, well, when, when Neo is surprised and he says, this isn't real, Morpheus replies and he says, what is real? If you're talking about what you could feel, smell, taste, and see, then real is simply electrical signals interpreted by your brain. This is the world that you know now. The world as it was at the end of the 20th century. It exists now only as part of a neural interactive simulation that we call the matrix. You have been living in a dream world, Neo. So in other words, the reality that he thinks is present is gone. The machines have taken over the world, okay? And the matrix, his former life as a software engineer, was all a projection by the machine. It wasn't the real world. The machines were projecting that reality for him to stay alive and keep engaging his mind so that they could be fed energy through that mental energy and physical energy of the body, of the person in the pod, okay? And this is the world as it really is. It's devastating. And this is suggested that, that our world is devastated. Our world is completely devastated. Truth is devastated. Nature is devastated, okay? Ourselves are devastated. We are destroyed as a people. And there's just a wasteland. Uh, and, you know, the machines basically are running the show. And what that suggests is machine consciousness is running the show. So humans are no longer born, as he describes it. They are now grown in these pods. And this, these are harvesting machines, these big, huge uh, octopus-like creatures are harvesting human beings that are all in each one of these little pods. And this is what how they live from their birth. They're in these machines and they feed the system. They actually give their energy to the system. About This is about us feeding the system through our compliance with it. So Morpheus says that the AI that took over the world was a singular consciousness that spawned a race an entire race of machines. He refers to it as a consciousness. Again, it's machine consciousness. It is intellect with it completely divorced from any wisdom. It is intellect completely divorced from any true care or heart or compassion. That's the machine world. Uh, the world of I don't care as long as I get mine. That's the matrix that we're living in. That's the consciousness that fuels that system of control. Okay? So he says... The machines have found all the energy they will ever need, meaning human beings. They, they need us. They feed on us. He says there are fields, endless fields, where human beings are no longer born. They are grown. For the longest time, I wouldn't believe in myself. And then I saw the fields with my own eyes. 
Standing there facing the pure, horrifying precision of it all, I came to realize the obviousness of the truth. And here's where we get the answer to the question of the first movie. He, Morpheus answers the question himself. He says, what is the matrix? Control. Control is what the matrix is. And the system that we're living in is all about control. A police state society. Total lockdown society coming in, brought on by keeping people in a completely illusory, dumbed down condition from the moment that they are born. And that's what the machine consciousness is all about. And keeping people in a completely asleep condition from the moment that we're born is like. He answers the question. There it is. What is the matrix? Control. The matrix is a dream world built to keep us under control in order to change a human being into this. And he holds up a battery because we are their fuel through our consent to this system of control that has been built up. I would suggest that what the matrix ultimately is, is this. It's not just control. It's a specific kind of control. The matrix is mind control. This is where the real matrix is operating. It's operating in the realm of mind to keep people in a dreamlike state, in a state of unconsciousness, so that they cannot really see what's going on in our reality and then just accept the projected version of reality at face value. Neo is horrified by this and immediately tries to reject it. Of course, when people are first waking up to the nature of our reality, they're very angry. And they, they want to lash out at who's telling them the, the truth. They don't want to hear it. So he says, no, I don't believe it. It's not possible. And Morpheus again responds, I didn't say it would be easy. I just said it would be the truth. That's all he was ever offering him. He wasn't telling him you're going to wake up to a wonderful fantasy land. You're going to wake up to a wonderful world. You know, you're going to wake up and see the truth for what it is. A world of horror that it's our responsibility to change. Okay. So he hits him with even harder information after that, which he's even less prepared to handle. He says, uh, Neo asks him, I can't go back, can I? And he says, no, but if you could, would you really want to? You know, who wants to go back into the, the illusion world after they see the world as it is, even though it's horrible? You know, most people don't make that decision. They, 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 they want to at least know what the truth is. And he says, we never free a mind once it reaches a certain age. It's dangerous, and the mind has trouble letting go, which you can see in the world with people who have developed real attachments to the system. It's very difficult for them to let go of it. He says, I did what I did because I had to. When the Matrix was first built, there was a man born inside, which we call the One. Morpheus calls him the One, who had the ability to change whatever he wanted, to make the Matrix as he saw, remake the Matrix as he saw fit. It was he who freed the first of us and taught us the truth. As long as the matrix exists, human beings will never be free. And what was the matrix? Control. So substitute the word, the allegory, put it in there. As long as the matrix exists, human beings will never be free. What is the matrix? Control. As long as the desire to control exists, you will never be free, ever. So, he says, after he died, meaning the one, his return was prophesied. And it was prophesied that his coming would hail the destruction of the matrix, the destruction of the world of control. And that the war between us and the machines would end, bringing peace to our people, bringing freedom to our people. He says, that is why there are those of us who have spent our entire lives searching the matrix, looking for him. I did what I did because I believe that search is over, referring to Neo. So he just drops on to Neo that he believes that this guy is the savior of humanity, that he's the savior of the world. He just woke up. He's newly woken up to the reality that's all around him, and he's still horrified by it. And now this guy just hit him with the fact that he's the savior. Or so Morpheus believes. Okay? So let's continue. Morpheus then, okay, let's look at what the name Neo really means, allegorically. Neo represents our neocortex, the higher part of the brain. 
in the newest part of the brain in evolutionary terms. Neo is a Latin prefix meaning new. Okay? It's also an anagram for the, the word one. You just rearrange the letters of Neo and you get one. So what he what Neo actually represents that is going to be our savior is balancing the left and right brain hemispheres, okay? and bringing the entire brain complex together as one, ultimately bringing consciousness together as one. That can't be done unless it can be done physiologically. Then we can do it with higher consciousness. But if the brain is in a state of imbalance toward the left hemisphere or the right hemisphere, we're not in higher consciousness. We're in left brain consciousness is pure machine consciousness, and right brain conscience, consciousness is pure slave consciousness. Okay, that's just accepting whatever happens to you without doing anything. Total passivity, and this is total, uh, you know, uh, male action drive that has no compassion in it. Only when we bridge these two in conjunction with the heart do we really wake up to our higher selves. Okay, so what Neo represents is this uh, occult or this uh, esoteric concept of the new man. The, the, the being that we need to give birth to by working upon ourselves and our consciousness, all right? And bringing our thoughts, our emotions, and our actions into alignment once we have balanced these hemispheres of the brain. It is the enlightened or illuminated man. It's a new being, a new species, so to speak. It's the next stage of human evolutionary development, which happens in consciousness, not physically. It happens here and here. That's where that evolution takes place. So that's what ultimately Neo represents. And again, that is the savior. That is our savior. That's what we need to do. That's where we need to go if we're going to really create any lasting positive change in our reality. This is the famous fight scene. Uh, Morpheus takes Neo into their training construct and begins to train him, okay, uh, to try to free his mind, all right? And again, this is where I got, this scene is where I got the phrase, free your mind from. The, 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 the conference is named directly after this movie from this scene in The Matrix, okay? So he says, you know, he's fighting, uh, Neo is fighting Morpheus, and he cannot beat him. He's, you know, he's given the, all the programs for jujitsu jiu and other forms of kung fu, and he, he knows all the forms and the techniques, but he still can't beat the, uh, Morpheus, who is older and, you know, seemingly weaker body-wise, you know, he's in better shape uh, as a physical specimen, uh, Neo is, but he can't beat him. And he's like, you know, why do you think you can't beat me? And he says, do you believe that me being any stronger or faster here has anything to do with my muscles in this place, meaning the construct? So he's trying to explain to him, this is all about being strong here in the mind. That's, that's where, um, when we start to take action in this, in this realm, that our strength has to reside. And he says, I am trying to free your mind, Neo, but I can only show you the door. You are the one that has to walk through it. So, you know, you could lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. You could show someone the truth, but you can't make them accept it. That's what he's saying. He's saying, you have to let it all go. Fear has to be let go. Doubt has to be let go. Disbelief. Free your mind. He says, you're the one who has to walk through the door, suggesting that ultimately only the person themselves creates transformation. Transformation is created within, and it's done according to our accepting the truth and then putting it into practice in our lives. So you're the one who has to do it. He shows them another training program, which they call the jump program. And this is about having faith in yourself. All right. He starts them on this building and he's telling him you need to jump to that other building across an entire city street. And this is obviously impossible in the quote real world, but he's trying to, he's trying to train his mind out of its weakness and build up confidence and build up belief in oneself. So Morpheus makes the jump because he's already at that level of consciousness, and he asks him to follow. And of course, Neo isn't at that level of awareness yet, and so he plummets into the street, and, you know, the, the street do doesn't kill him. It, like, you know, acts like a trampoline, but he kind of is a little bit injured. He spits up a little bit of blood, 
And uh, I'm sorry. And he he says in this, if you're after coming out of that program, spinning up some blood, he says, if you're killed in the matrix, that means that you die here. And Morpheus simply responds, the body cannot live without the mind. So ultimately, the mind is what's creating our projections in the real world. So continuing, he then shows him another training program that is all about the agents of the system and how they're really all around us. And the agents can be anybody within the system because the system is what people are attached to. Okay, So they're not willing to follow the truth. They're not willing to do the right thing. They're going to do whatever the system commands me to do. So anybody's a potential agent of the, of the control system. Morpheus says the matrix is a system. That system is our enemy. When you're inside, what do you see? Businessmen, teachers, lawyers, carpenters, the very minds of the people we're trying to save. But until we do, these people are still part of that system, and that makes them our enemy. You have to understand that most of these people are not ready to be unplugged. Many of them are so inured, they are so hopelessly dependent on the system that they will fight to protect it. Yeah. They will fight to protect their enslavers. They don't want to be free because they've never even understood what the concept of freedom is, let alone practice that are lived it in their lives. They love being under control. They love being dominated. They love being enslaved. And they wanted to stay that way because it's staying that way means ultimately they have no true personal responsibility. The thing that they're really trying to duck more than anything else. So he's trying to explain to them, these people basically love it the way that it is. And many of them are ready to see the truth and be unplugged from the mind control system. So he says, were you listening to me, Neo, or were you looking at the woman in the red dress? This is a clear reference to the occult concept of the scarlet woman, and it represents the base desires. Um, it represents um, uh, saying in ego consciousness, being distracted, you know, having your work uh, put to the back burner due to distractions, things like that. And he explains to him, uh, he tells him, look again, and when Neo turns around to look for the woman in the red dress, it's an agent holding a gun to his head, okay? So what he's trying to tell them is that agents of the system can be anybody. They, they can infiltrate anywhere. And he says, this is a training program that's designed to teach you one thing. If you're not one of us, you're one of them. Anyone that we have not unplugged is potentially an agent. Sooner or later, someone is going to have to fight them. Every single man or woman who has ever stood their ground, mm -hmm. everyone who has fought an agent has died. But where they have failed, you will succeed because their strength and their speed are still based in a world that is built on rules. Because of that, they will never be as strong or as fast as you can be. And Neo says, well, what are you trying to tell me? That I can dodge bullets? And Neo says, no. I'm trying to tell you that when you're ready, you won't have to. That this will not have to come to a hot revolution if we can do it in consciousness. If we get to a level of consciousness where we stop holding on to our attachments to this control system, we won't have to do this with a war. We will be able to do it by stepping away from the control system and letting it fall, by refusing to comply, by stopping giving our energy to it, to perpetuate it through our own energy. That's the real solution. And not a single bullet would have to be fired if we can get it done that way. And that's what all of my work is about. 100% of my work is to try to avert that hot revolutionary potential. I don't want to see it come to that. I'll be ready if it does come to that, guaranteed. But that's not what I really want to see happen. That otherwise, if I did want to see that happen, I would shut my mouth and never say a word. All of my work is to try to avert that. All of it. Okay? So, the next scene is about uh, Cypher. He's one of the crew on the Nebuchadnezzar, Morpheus' ship. And he is hardly upset by what he has learned in the real world. He hates being unplugged from the Matrix and wants to go back in. He wants to go back to sleep. He wants to just live out his life and just feed his base ego-driven desires and not pay attention to the truth and not try to change because he doesn't have the will to do it. He doesn't have the will, the sustained effort and will to continue to press forward. So 
His question is, why, oh, why didn't I take a blue pill? You know, I woke up to this world of shit, basically, and I hate it, and I don't want to be a part of it anymore. I want to go back to sleep, all right? So his concept of his ignorance is bliss, and he makes a deal with the machines that if he gives up Morpheus, if he betrays Morpheus and gives him up to the machines so they can get the codes that they need to attack the last human city of Zion, which we'll talk about later, that... Um, his body will then be actually physically reinserted into the matrix, will be found in the real world and physically reinserted into the matrix. And he'll, he's doing this for a deal that he'll be made someone important and rich, like an actor. Yeah, we'll, yeah, take, yeah, we'll, yeah. Take question, we'll take questions afterward. So uh, he's going to betray the crew, okay? And uh, one of the next scenes is... The heroes go into the Matrix because Morpheus is taking Neo to see another character known as the Oracle. We'll get to what she represents. She's basically one who makes prophecy about what's going to happen in the future. And uh, in the waiting room to see the Oracle character, he encounters this little boy who we don't know his name. He's just referred to as the boy with the spoon or spoon boy. Okay, And he's bending these spoons with his mind in the knots in the Matrix because... He's woken up. He knows this is a real, it's a computer projected reality. And he can just, it's mind over matter. It's the will over the physical world. Okay. Reshaping it as he sees fit. And he's trying to teach Neo to do it. And Neo's having a problem with it. And he says, do not, the, the spoon boy says to Neo, do not try to bend the spoon. That's impossible. Instead, only try to realize the truth. And Neo says, what truth? And the spoon boy replies, that there is no spoon, meaning you know that this is in the matrix. It's in the world of illusion. It, it exercise your will over it and change it, okay? And he says, there is no spoon. He says, only then will you see that it is not the spoon that bends. It is only yourself that bends, okay? So he's saying, you have to change in here and in here if you want to see change reflected in the external reality. It has to happen from within first. Neo finally meets the Oracle character, represented by this uh, black woman. And that she is about prophecy. She is about the intuition. And she is about knowing the self. That's what this character represents. She's the deep innermost recesses of the subconscious mind. Okay? And she tells Neo that he should look at the sign behind the door behind her door when you walk into the temple of the oracle. This is a clear reference to the Delphic oracle in Greece, which was the center of the hermetic mystery traditions in the ancient world. And this is the main saying, here you see it in Latin, temet noske. In Greek, um, I don't know what the inscription was off the top of my head, but basically what that means is know thyself. And in the hermetic tradition, they said, know thyself, and only through knowing thyself will you know the universe and the gods, okay? So this is the ultimate command of all mystery tradition teachings. If you don't know the self, you're doomed. If you know the self, then you can create wondrous change in the world. And that's the problem. We don't know ourselves. We've forgotten who we are, and we don't understand how consciousness works to create the reality that we're witnessing and that we're experiencing. And therefore, that, that's why we continue to create in ignorance. If only when we know the self will we create consciously. So she says, do you know what that means? It's Latin, it means know thyself. Being the one is just like being in love. No one can tell you you're in love. You just know it through and through. She says, sorry, kid. You have the gift, but it looks like you're waiting for something. Maybe in the next life, who knows? So he hasn't built up the confidence. He doesn't know himself enough to know he is the one. He hasn't come to that awakening level yet, that level of consciousness to know he's the one who has to go out and make change, okay? So she tells him, well, you, it seems like you're waiting for something. You know, you don't know that you're the one? Well, then I guess you're not. If that's what you believe, then it's true. So he leaves kind of despondent and uh, back on the ship, uh, Cypher betrays some of the other characters and kills one of them, all right? And he takes over the ship, 
and he finally betrays Morpheus, and Morpheus falls into the hands of agents within the Matrix before they can actually get out. So here you see Morpheus being tortured and questioned by some of the agents, and Agent Smith says to Morpheus, in reference to the Matrix ex itself, the system of control, have you ever stared at it and marveled at its beauty, its genius? Billions and billions of people just living out their lives completely oblivious, talking about the control system we're living in. He says, did you ever know that the, did you know that the first matrix was designed to be a perfect human world? Where none suffered, where everyone would be happy. It was a complete disaster. No one would accept the programming. And that's because as a species, human beings define their reality through misery and suffering. This is Smith's dark, poisoned worldview of humanity, of how he sees humanity. And it, this is part of our poison worldview. Why we're still stuck in the matrix is this is a lot of people's poison worldview. He says the perfect world was actually a dream that your primitive cerebrum kept trying to wake up from. That you couldn't just accept that things were okay and that you know nature was just you know ruling the day and you were going along in harmony with it. You weren't trying to fight against it. You weren't trying to fight against the laws of creation. You weren't trying to fight against you know your your true nature. You were you were just going along with it. That that would have been a perfect world, but you couldn't do that. Your mind kept trying to wake up from it. It wanted something else. It wanted something more. You know until it finally would only accept this prison reality, that desire to control. He says that's why the matrix was redesigned to this, meaning you know the modern world, the system of control. So he says, when I try to classify your species, I realize that you're not actually mammals. Every mammal on this planet instinctively develops a natural equilibrium with the surrounding environment, but humans do not. You move to an area, multiply and multiply until every natural resource is consumed. The only way you survive is to spread to another area. Hmm. There is another organism on this planet that follows this same pattern. Do you know what it is? A virus. Human beings are a disease, a cancer of this planet. You are a plague and we are the cure, meaning the machines, because he's one of the programs in the machine world. So that's his worldview. And that is the, that is the dominator's worldview. That is really what they think. That's how they think. And unfortunately, they have given us, they have infected our minds with that worldview. And many of us think that same way. We're not a virus. Uh, if we continue to think that we are, we're falling right into their game, into their hands, and believing in their worldview, which is ultimately going to lead us right into their continued control. So he's trying to break Morpheus' spirit. He's trying to break his mind. So Neo and Trinity go back into the Matrix to lead a rescue attempt of Morpheus. Okay, And this is basically... You're trying to rescue the truth and keep the truth alive. That's what these characters are doing. That's what this represents. Morpheus is the truth. He's trying to, they're trying to rescue to save the truth from being exterminated, from being broken. Okay? And they, there's a, another theme in the movie of going up. We'll return to this later. Going up to a higher level is the solution. They have to take an elevator shaft and they have to take it via an act of faith, via a cable. They have to cut the elevator away from the cable and ride the cable all the way up to the top floor. This is an act of faith that the truth will lead you where you need to go, up to a higher level of awareness. Finally, they rescue Morpheus with a helicopter um, and a, a Gatling gun. And uh, the last effort to save Morpheus is a leap. It's a leap of faith. It's using all of the will and suspending yourself Okay, completely extend, extending yourself to come into harmony with truth. That's what this scene represents. After they save him, Morpheus says, you know I, know, I knew you could do it. I believed in you. He says, sooner or later, you're going to have to realize, just as I realized, that there is a difference between knowing the path and walking the path. That's, that's a powerful, actual, that's a Buddhist philosophy, that the, the, there's the path and knowing it. 
And that's intellectually and, you know, in an intelligence perspective, understanding what is real and understanding what is right. But then there's a big difference because, because then you have to engage that in, your, in the physical reality by using your will to put that knowledge into action. And that's what real wisdom is. And that's what Morpheus is saying in Neo after that scene. There's a difference between knowing the path and walking the path. After this, Neo finally starts to get some, some courage and resolve. And he's starting to build up confidence in himself. And he's the first person who will not run. He will face the control system head on and take on the, the agents of the state in the form of Smith. Trinity looks is looking at this from outside of the Matrix, horrified, saying, my God, what is he doing? And Morpheus' response is, he's beginning to believe. He's beginning to believe because he's beginning to believe in himself, that he is an agent for change. And he is representing and fighting for and championing the truth. And he's willing to defend that truth against the control system. Okay? So, he is shot in the same room where the movie begins. People miss this part of it, okay? It's the heart of the city hotel. Watch it again, you'll see it. In room 303, which is where Trinity was under assault at the very beginning of the movie, so we've come full circle. Now, that number is very significant in Masonic terms because 33 is the level or the degree of illuminated masonry, okay, the 33rd degree, because it's the degree of temperature when water begins to melt. It's frozen in a, as a block of ice, meaning we are encased in ice. Our heart is not actually, we are not warm, or we have not thawed our negative emotions, our, our uh, you know, our care is not really flowing. But when we come up to the 33rd degree, the light of the sun, knowledge, okay, of the true self has thought it and has made, turned it back into water. And so that's what 33 represents here. And I, I guarantee you that is no accident. He is shot and dies in the matrix, in the world of illusion, because the 33rd level in Freemasonry is also about death and rebirth. It is about resurrection to a new form of consciousness, to enlightened awareness, which is why it is called the first level of the illuminated degrees of masonry, okay? So that's what this part of it is. He is shot and killed, and he is now dead to the world of illusion. But now, this next scene, he is revived. He is resurrected and brought back to life by Trinity, in an act of love, she kisses him and brings him back to life. This is representative that only true care and compassion can finally resurrect right action. That's it. She represents the sacred feminine energy of true care and compassion and love energy. And that's the only thing that can ultimately resurrect right action in the world, which is what Neo represents our will. When he comes back to life, it is the most significant, it's probably the most important part of the entire film. Because he says one word when he stands up after coming back from the dead. Okay, he says one word, and that word is no. No is the word that Neo speaks when he comes back to life. And this is suggested that only when we begin to say no to the control system are we ever really going to really be reborn and really come back to life as a species. The, the agents of the system fire their guns at him and he can now stop the bullets just by projecting his consciousness. And this is representative of, again, if we come up to that level of consciousness and say no, no bullets will have to be fired ultimately. We'll be able to stop that eventuality, that negative um, future. So, the word no, I call it the most powerful word in the universe in my work. The concept of apophysis, A-P-O-P-H-A-S-I-S. -S. Apophysis means to say no. It means to not seek or to not acknowledge or give energy into the system. It is withdrawal. Withdrawal from what is wrong. And in withdrawing from what is wrong, we're ultimately doing what is right. So that's the most powerful energy, the most the lost word in this call. And that's what we need to step into that form of consciousness.
When he wakes up, he can see the code of the matrix. He can see it for what it really is. He has new sight. He has new eyes. He is now really realizing the truth. And he can seemingly fight the control system now with a hand behind his back. It's becoming easier for him because he now can see the truth. So the illusion as it's projected at him now, he can strike it down at will. He actually lunges himself forward and projects himself like a missile at the center of Smith's being, the agent. And he goes into his body and he blows him apart from the inside in a hill and a shower of light and green energy, which again represents care and love. And this is suggestive of we need to get into the heart of the people who are actually still giving themselves over to this control system, the agents. We have to reach them ultimately to change them, help to change them from the inside through care. And then we won't have to, have, like I said, have a hot revolution. A single bullet wouldn't have to be fired if enough people get to that level of consciousness and are willing to do that work. Therein lies the problem, that there doesn't seem to be enough people with that level of consciousness and who are also willing to engage that work. I keep telling people on my show, we are not going to change this reality unless we can reach the people who are still willing to give over their mind and body to this system of control. You have to change their mind. Actually has to be changed. And people need to be willing to do that work of influence and that work of reaching out to those people. Otherwise, forget it. It isn't going to happen. We're going to see a very dark and painful future if more of us don't wake up to that level and become willing to do that work. So, the movie ends with the phrase system failure, the control system coming down, hope of it coming down anyway. And Neo says, I know that you're afraid. He's talking to the agents inside the matrix now. I know you're afraid. You're afraid of us. You're afraid of change. I'm going to show all of these people what you don't want them to see. I'm going to show them a world without you, a world without control, without boundaries, where any, a world where anything is possible. And synchronistically, when he's saying the words where anything is possible, right after that, when this fades out, it zooms in to the M and the F, male and female, I would suggest. Okay? The, the masculine and feminine consciousness that is within us being bridged and brought together, and it opens as a doorway into another world. And that is how the first movie ends. Very powerful symbolism. Okay? Let's take a look at the second movie. So, the second movie is about... Yeah. Why are we in the Matrix? And this movie gets into much deeper philosophical frameworks than even the first one. I would suggest this is also why it's very unpopular. People are resistant, even if they're awake to the control system, to understanding why we're in the current human condition. So, let's jump in. Once again, the movie opens, the sacred feminine under distress, okay, being accosted, being shot at, falling from a building, okay, falling, care, who she represents, love is falling after being, you know, pummeled with, with bullets, okay, and Neo is asleep still. This is suggesting that he may see the matrix, may be able to start working within it, Okay, and finding his power, but ultimately he's still asleep. There's still more for him to know. And that's about why this is created, because only in understanding the reason for something, the causal factor, can we really understand what's necessary to undo it. Okay? We get our first glimpse of the last human city, the, first, the only place machines haven't completely worked out, called Zion. And people have a very mis- her misunderstanding of what this city represents. In the Kabbalistic tradition, in Kabbalah, Zion actually represents the spiritual center of creation, where the manifested reality is projected from, okay? So spirit, okay, and uh, care, and our thoughts, these are the things that are actually the projector 
And then the projection is the physical manifested reality. Well, Zion is the center of the spirit in the Kabbalistic tradition, all right? And it also represents a positive hope for a better future world. That's what Zion represents in esoteric traditions. So that's what this rep represents. More overtly, all it represents is the underground. People who are still in the underground. They're not the mainstream because the city is deep underground. It's described down near the core of the earth. Well, there's a core of people who know the truth and they're basically still deep underground. You know, internet radio, uh, fanzines and magazines and, you know, things, you know, meetings like this and conferences like we're having. It's not mainstream. It's still very underground. We're trying to bring it up to the surface. Okay, but it's still deep in the underground world. And that's what Zion represents. There's a big conflict between Morpheus and Commander Locke, a subplot theme that runs throughout this movie. And this is the um, tension between one who has faith in what is achievable and possible and someone who is still really trapped in five cents only thinking. Okay, so what, uh, Morpheus, you know, has faith in higher consciousness, that it's really the ultimate solution. And uh, Locke is still all about just, you know, physical things to do in this world. I, I call it, he's the rearranging furniture on the Titanic guy, whereas Morpheus really knows what's necessary to create the real change. So um, Locke says, I don't care about oracles or prophecies or messiahs. I care about one thing, stopping that army from destroying this city, meaning the machine army who's coming to attack Zion. And he says, to do that, I need soldiers to obey my orders. So he's still in the controlled consciousness from the Matrix. Not much has changed with him. You know, he's all about, well, there's linear physical things that need to be done, and I need people to obey. You know, and that's not, that's not the consciousness that's going to get us out of this mess. Morpheus says, with all due respect, Commander, there's only one way to save this city, Neo. And what he's referring to is that unity consciousness that we have to get to. So let's move forward. Morpheus gives a phenomenal speech in this that's very inspiring. He says, the machines have gathered an army. And as I speak, that army is drawing nearer to our home. He's telling this to the people of Zion. We have a difficult time ahead of us. But if we are to be prepared for it, we must first shed our fear of it. I stand here before you now truthfully unafraid because I remember that for a hundred years we have fought these machines. I remember that for a hundred years they've sent their armies to destroy us. And after a century of war, I remember that which matters most. We are still here. He says, tonight, let us send a message to that army. Let us make them remember that this is Zion and we are not afraid. So, incredibly powerful speech delivered by Morpheus about fear and how to conquer it. Um, in this scene, we see that Smith has a new ability in this film to replicate himself. Agents are now replicating and they're everywhere, okay? So he puts his hand into the heart and turns it black. Okay, highly symbolic. He's destroying people's care. He's eating their heart. And then he turns them into one of them, an agent for the system of control. Okay, so um, he takes over one of the uh, people who is one of the crew members in, on another ship, Bane, his name is. Now, Bane is symbolic. Bane means poison in Latin. Okay, so th that's how we are poisoned. We become poisoned through the heart. Actually, if you really want to get technical, what Bane means in Latin is not just poison. It means an agent of death. So highly symbolic. And again, poison is, was the main agent of death. Use so it became synonymous with poison. You know, so Bane is actually an agent that leads to death. Okay? So um, we see him taking over people through the heart, and that's, you know, ultimately bringing them toward death, because that's what, that's what he represents. Smith represents death, as we'll see in a moment. Um, this movie is all about conversations that deal with purpose. Purpose, okay? He says, uh, this is a scene where Neo is talking to one of the counselors of Zion, and they go out into the engineering section, and 
He's telling him, he's having a conversation with him about all the machines that run the city. He said, uh, um, Counselor Heyman is his name. He says, I think about all of those people still plugged into the matrix. And when I look at these machines, I can't help thinking that in a way we're plugged into them. He's talking about technology in general. And Neo answers, but we control these machines. They don't control us. And the counselor re replies, it does make one wonder just what is control. Neo replies, if we want it, we could shut these machines down. And the counselor says, that's it. That's control, isn't it? If we wanted, we could smash them to bits. Although if we did, we'd have to consider what would happen to our lights, our heat, our air. There's so much in this world I don't understand. See that machine? It has something to do with recycling our water supply. I have absolutely no idea how it works, but I do understand the reason for it to work. So here, purpose is brought up. There's a reason for things. Now, I would suggest this is also about technology and how it's a dual-edged sword. It can be used to help mankind, and it can be used as an agency for control. It's about how will we use it? Will we use it truly for our better benefit and our uplift, or are we going to use it to bring in greater and greater modes of control? And that's the conversation that's taking place here. The councilman finally says, I have absolutely no idea how you, Neo, do think some of the things that you're able to do, but I believe there's a reason for that as well. Again, purpose bring wrong. Why, in other words? I only hope we will understand that reason before it's too late. So what he's suggesting here is we have to really understand what is driving your level of will so that we can help other people to achieve that level of consciousness and put their knowledge into action to get over their fear and actually do the work that is required. If we can understand what, what helps bring somebody into that full potentiality of their power, then maybe we'll have a shot. So very powerful scene, actually. Okay. Seraph, this character here, is the protector of the oracle, and he is representative of the Seraphim, an angel, a, a group of angels, angelic intelligences. That's, his name is short for Seraph. He takes Neo into the Matrix to see the oracle, and uh, the conversation between Neo and the oracle in this movie is also all about purpose. It is all about the why of things, okay? The Oracle says to Neo, we can never see past the choices that we do not understand. You didn't come here to make the choice. You've already made it. You're here to try to understand why you made it. In other words, she's telling him, you have to get to the why of your decisions. You have to understand the primary motivating factors of behavior. If you can't do that, you're done. He says, what if I can't do that? What happens if I fail? And she says, then Zion will fall, meaning humanity will be doomed. We can't understand what drives our behavior, our primary drives and motivations, the causal factors that lead us to make the choices that we do. We're doomed as a species. Very, very powerful. A crux of the philosophy in this movie. Okay? So... The Oracle then says to Neo, the second part of this conversation is about what he has to do. And she says, the machine mainframe is where you must go, where the path of the one ends. You can save Zion if you reach the source, but to do that, you will need the key maker. We're going to talk about what he represents in a moment. He disappeared some time ago, and he's being held prisoner by a very dangerous program, one of the oldest programs, he is called the Merovingian. We're going to really get into what we're talking about. He, the Merovingian will not let the keymaker go willingly. What does he want, Neo asks, and the oracle says, what do all men with power want? More power. Okay, let's move on. Neo finally encounters Smith in this movie after the Matrix leaves, and they have the big fight scene, the CGI fight scene, where he's fighting thousands of Smith agents. Smith has now become a virus, an agency of death that is replicating himself throughout our world. That's what this represents. And Neo is the one who has to try to stop it. Again, higher consciousness stopping the spreading of the destruction of the heart energy, destruction of care. All right, so after that fight scene, 
the, they uh, go back into the matrix to try to get the keymaker out from the control of the Merovingian. So the three characters, Morpheus, Neo, and Trinity, go into the stronghold of the Merovingian. Now the Merovingian, the name is suggestive. It's about the Merovingian bloodline, one of the uh, high um, connected bloodlines to, to the highest levels of the control system. This is an occult family that dates back into the ancient world. And um, there's a lot that we go into on that. You could research the Merovingian bloodline for yourself. Basically, who this character represents is the super, quote, elite that is controlling this world and reaping the benefits of the control system, okay? And he doesn't want to give up his power. He just wants more and more power. I would suggest that he is representative of the dark occultists who understand the human psyche, how it works, and are completely manipulating it for their ends. So these, he's, the representative, he's representative of the class of sorcerers who are really controlling the minds of the people of this world and therefore getting them to do their bidding. The, this scene is the most powerful scene in the whole movie, in the whole trilogy, I should say, not just this individual movie. It's the most important scene in the whole trilogy because it gets to the crux of why are we in this position? So it starts with Morpheus saying to the Merovingian, you know why we are here. The Merovingian says, I'm a trafficker of information. I know everything I can. Well, of course I know why you're here. The question is, do you know why you are here? And that, that question is a big question, meaning do you know why you've come to this place in the world? Do you know why? It's not about why are you in this building talking to me. Do you know why humanity has arrived at the condition that it has arrived at? Is what this that's the big question. Do you know what that those causal factors are about? Because if you don't, good luck on doing it. Good luck making a better world. You know, it's never going to happen unless you know what got you to where you're at first. Right. So he says, um, the Merovingian says, "Do you know why you're here?" Morpheus replies. We're looking for the keymaker. The Merovingian replies, oh, yes, it's true, the keymaker, of course. But that's not a reason. This is not a why. The keymaker is, his very nature is a means. It's not an end. And so to look for him is to be looking for a means to do what? What he's telling him here is you're looking for the way out of your mess, but you don't want to understand why that mess is present to begin with. And without that knowledge in hand, you're never going to get out of the mess. You have to know what create, why the mess was created in the first place. What got you to that condition? So Neo says, you know the answer to that question. And the Merovingian says, but do you? You think you do, but you do not. You're here because you were sent here, referring to the oracle. She sent him here. He doesn't know what the keymaker is, what he represents. You were told to come here and then you obey. And that's the way of all things. Right? He says, you see, there's really only one constant. There is only one universal. There's one universal law, ultimately. There is only one ultimate truth. The only real truth. Causality. Action, reaction, cause and effect. Morpheus replies to that saying, everything begins with choice. And the Merovingian replies, wrong. Choice is an illusion created between those with power and those without. That is the nature of the universe. Causality. There is no escape from it. Our only hope our only peace is to understand it, to understand the why. Why is the only real source of power. Without it, you are powerless. Why is the only real source of power. Without it, you are powerless. Another link in the chain, the chain of servitude and slavery until you understand the why. 
there it is. There's the, the conversation happening between the, the, the five of them. Of course, this is Persephone, the wife of the Merovingian. He ultimately represents Hades or Satan, okay, in mythology. And this is Persephone, the wife of Hades, who is held captive by Hades in Greek mythology. Again, it's another symbol of the sacred feminine being held captive by the force of evil and control. So why is the only real source of power without it? You are powerless. Understand that. Persephone, again, represents the sacred feminine being held captive, again, by dark forces. Uh, she ultimately betrays the Merovingian and helps the heroes get to the keymaker in the dungeon he's being held in. Okay, so... They finally do get the keymaker after a long, drawn-out battle with the Merovingian's henchmen. And then these, again, represent all people who have uh, attached them to the control system, who are willing to just follow along a madman and a person who's evil and just totally driven by control for money or for status or for, you know, this notion of themselves of, as, you know, so, somebody who is uh, fulfilling a role or a purpose. That's, that's what they think is ultimately important and why they want to do it. They don't know anything else. That's what they know to be their purpose. And so, therefore, they give themselves totally over to something that really isn't doing anybody any real good in the world. They think that it is what it isn't. This scene on the highway where Morpheus has to rescue the keymaker ultimately represents the importance of defending truth <laughs> on the information superhighway, the internet. That if we're going to really get the truth out there to people and, and unlock them, unlock their minds, we cannot let the internet fall into the hands of the agents. So that's what that whole battle is about, getting the key maker uh, off of the, um, rescued him on the internet, on the super highway. They finally do rescue the key maker with Neo's help. Neo has to come down and sweep them out of an uh, explosion, a huge explosion. So again, that represents he's rescuing the truth and the key to unlock people's minds who the key maker represents. The key maker represents the unlocking of the deepest subconscious desires, getting into the subconscious mind and really deeply penetrating, exploring and understanding our motivations and, and hidden desires. That's what the key maker is. And that's why they need him. That's why they can't really do what they're going to do, which is unlock people's minds without the knowledge of how to do that. Okay, so he formulates plans with a plan with three captains of three ships to go into the matrix, disarm the defense system, and get Neo into a hidden part of the matrix, a back door, so to speak, so he can get to the source and do what he needs to do. Okay, uh, more. Uh, Smith is, of course, replicating here. You see him trying to take over Morpheus in one of the backdoor corridors while Neo was fighting him off. Um, finally, Trinity decides to help after one of the ship captains are, uh, fails in their mission to, to disarm part of the defense system. Trinity decides to go into the Matrix after promising Neo she would stay out of it. He's trying to protect her at this point because he has seen her death in a vision in his dreams, and he doesn't want her entering the Matrix to try to change the uh, the plan, try to uh, make the plan work, but she goes in anyway. She decides to sacrifice herself, go in even though there's tons of agents in there, to bring down part of the control grid so that the key maker, Morpheus, and Neo can do what they need to do. Finally, it succeeds, and the key maker opens this back door in the Matrix. Again, these are the subconscious, hidden desires that are all locked up and bound up in our mind that have to be unlocked, that have to be penetrated and walked into so we can understand the why of, of our behavior, okay? And more, uh, Neo finally walks through the door, and this is Stargate symbolism. This is, again, going into the state of light symbolism, of enlightenment, of real, real true knowledge of self, which is why he walks through a blinding door of white light, all right? He ends up in a room filled with screens, and he is, this is the realm of the architect of the matrix. And this is where the key conversation happens in this second film. This is the architect of the matrix, and this is Neo having a conversation with him. Here's how it goes. Neo asks, why am I here? Again, here's the first question. Why? Purpose. 
What is the purpose? Why am I here? The architect says, your life is the sum of the remainder of an unbalanced equation inherent to the programming of the matrix. The matrix is older than you know. This is the sixth version of it. Okay, so this is news to, to Neo. He is, is not aware of this. In other words, he's telling him there have been other incarnations of humanity. There have been other destructions through cataclysms. Okay, You're, this isn't the first time around on this great wheel of karma. You've done this before. That's what the, the, the architect of the matrix is telling Neo here. And he says, this is the sixth version. As you're undoubtedly gathering, the anomaly is systemic. It creates fluctuations in even the most simplistic equations. So this anomaly that he's talking about, what is it? Neo immediately recognized it and he says, choice. The problem is choice, isn't it? And the architect re replies, the first matrix I designed was quite naturally perfect. It was a work of art, flawless and sublime, a triumph equaled only by its monumental failure, again, because the human mind rejected that perfection. I redesigned it to more accurately reflect the varying grotesqueries of your nature. However, I was again frustrated by failure. The answer was stumbled upon by an intuitive program. And he's referring here to the oracle, again, who represents the intuitive capacity. Initially created to investigate certain aspects of the human psyche. Again, another reference that these are all aspects of the psyche, these programs. If I'm the father of the matrix, she would undoubtedly be its mother. Neo says the oracle. And the architect says she stumbled upon a solution whereby 99% of all the test subjects accepted the program. And what was this solution? The illusion of choice, the Hegelian dialectic. Do you want the Republicans or do you want the Democrats? Do you want labor or conservative? Do you want liberal or conservative? Coke, yeah. Yeah. Coke or Pepsi, exactly. <laughs> and it, that, that illusion of free choice is what gets people, even though it's a false choice, it's a false paradigm, gets people to accept the program of the matrix. And what the choice ultimately is, do you want this form of control or do you want this form of control? But either way, you're under control. See, it's this hand or this hand, but either one's going to punch you in the teeth. <laughs> because it's controlled by the same mind who doesn't give a damn about it. Okay? And that's the false choice that people are presenting. Hegelian dialectic is what this is called. The presentation of a false choice to give the person who you're controlling the illusion that they've made the choice for themselves. And this is all an illusion, just like politics. It's all an illusion, it's all fake, it's all puppet show, and the puppet master is getting ready to knock them out. Because he has the puppets on both hands, or whichever one you pick, you're getting knocked out by, you get dropped with. Okay? So, um, he says that those who refuse the program, while a tiny minority, if unchecked, would constitute an escalating probability of disaster and failure. Meaning, even, you know, he's trying to control the people who have woken up from the matrix. He wants everybody under control. He's not happy that even some people came out of it, because as long as there's some that came out, there's a possibility that they could bring the whole system down. So, Neo says this is about Zion, isn't it? Meaning the people who are awake, the people who have really come back to true humanity. And he says, the architect says, Zion is about to be destroyed because he sent his machine army after them. He says, this will be the sixth time we have destroyed it, sixth extermination of humanity, and we have become exceedingly efficient at it. The architect then says to Neo, the function of the one is only to return to the source, after which he's required to select from the matrix 23 individuals. That's a highly symbolic number, which represents Escape, getting out, is what the number 23 represents in occult terms. In other words, he got out of the matrix, but he's going to reload it. That's where the, the name comes from. You're, you're just starting the same system of control all over again. Because most people, when they come out of one system of control, what do they do? They build up another one. 
It isn't about laying down the sword. It's let's make a new system of control. And we'll be the new kings. We'll be the new rulers in this one. And we'll just do it all over again. It's, it's not, what, what he's trying to say is, you're going to, you know, we'll get you to a point of revolution, and then you'll just reload the matrix by bringing in another form of government. You know, that was the failure during our first revolution, where what should have been realized is that the problem is the belief in authority is the, pro the human problem. That's the problem of the human condition. And that's what needs to be abandoned, is that there is any people who are our authorities. Truth is our authority and nothing else. And we need to make that the goal of what we are going to actually give our energy to, truth, instead of belief in authority and other systems of control. So he says, he's telling Nia the whole program about the one. This prophecy is so all, it's all bunk. You know, all the one is supposed to do is restart the matrix. You usher in a revolution. We, we kill all the people in Zion. You take uh, some people out of the matrix and we start it all over again. Go around the wheel of karma all over again in a big revolution. Okay? The turning of the wheel of karma. He says, failure to comply with this process will result in a cataclysmic system crash, killing everyone that's connected to the matrix. All those vast human beings in those power plants. Okay? Coupled with the extermination of Zion, this will result in the extinction of the entire human race. So he's telling Neo, you're in control of whether the whole human race dies at this point. The fate of humanity is in your hands. He tells him that there's a door on the uh, left, which he, if he goes through, goes to the source, and he rebuilds the matrix and reloads the matrix. If he goes through the, the door uh, to the right or to his left, um, then he goes back into the matrix to rescue Trenton, who he's now become aware is in the matrix. So he says, he says, you won't let the total system crash happen. You can't. You need human beings to survive. And the architect says, there's levels of survival that we are prepared to accept. However, the relevant issue is here is whether or not you are ready to accept the responsibility of the death of every human being in your world. And the architect makes him aware that Trinity has entered the matrix to save Neo's life at the cost of her own. She was ready to sacrifice herself to save him. He says, this brings us to the moment of truth. The architect is speaking here. He says, there's two doors. One to the right that leads back to the source and the salvation of Zion. The door to your left leads back to the matrix, to Trinity, and to the end of your species. So you have to make that choice. He says, when Neo starts walking determinedly over to the door that leads back to Trinity to save his love, to save care, to save compassion in the heart, the architect says, hope is the quintessential human delusion. Simultaneously, the source of your greatest strength and your greatest weakness. He doesn't want Neo to make that choice because he wants the control system to continue. Ultimately, the only way that the matrix can be brought down is if we rescue Karen. And that's what this scene represents. Neo makes the right choice. He takes the correct door and he goes back to rescue Trinity, which ultimately represents the heart. Because unless we can resurrect the heart, there's no way out of this system of control. That is basically the second movie. I don't know if I have a slide here for that. Yes. Um, okay, so uh, no, uh, some action takes place after that. This agent shoots Trinity through the heart. Okay, this is representative that the agents are ultimately killing care. The agents of the system of control in our world are ultimately the ones who are annihilating care in the world. He shoots Trinity right through the middle of the heart. But of course, Neo comes and rescues her before she falls to the street. And he inserts his hand into her heart in the matrix and actually pumps her heart to bring her back to life. And this is representative of we have to actually bring care back to life in our world if we're going to stand a chance. We have to resurrect care by bringing the heart, getting the heart beating again. And that's, notice that that's all, it's done in green energy. Again, you see green being the main theme, the main color here, because green is the color, the frequency of balance. It's actually in between, in the visible spectrum, between the reds and the blues, where the masculine and feminine frequencies. It is the coming together, the sacred marriage 
of those two modes of consciousness, and that's what care energy is really all about. The middle, the center of the visible spectrum of light, green energy, is care energy, is love energy. Okay? So on board the Nebuchadnezzar, after uh, Neo comes back out of the Matrix, after rescuing Trinity, he tells Morpheus that the whole thing about the one, the whole prophecy of the one by the Oracle, the Oracle was just another one of the systems of control of the Matrix. And it was all about reloading the Matrix and starting it all up over again. So Mor uh, Morpheus is like devastated because this is his whole religion, this is his entire belief system, you know? And he's now having to realize, wow, that was all just part of the, the uh, illusion. I look at that as the, all the beliefs that are fed to us through religion and the New Age movements about externalizing the Savior is all part of the system of control because it gets you to stand down and you don't really take right action. You are looking at like, that's all in someone else's hands. We don't have to do nothing. You know, it's not about good works. It's about belief. Well, that's bunk. It's all about good works. It's all about actually making a change in the real world through an act of your will. And that's what love is all about. That's what higher consciousness, including Christ consciousness, is all about. The machines finally send a kamikaze mission to the Nebuchadnezzar to blow up the ship. And they succeed. The, the heroes just get off board before Nebuchadnezzar is annihilated by a bomb. One of the machines uh, becomes a bomb. Uh, one of the machines turns itself into a bomb, destroys the ship. That leaves them temporarily stranded, but as more machines are coming for them to, to physically destroy their bodies, Neo now holds up his hand in the real world and stops the machines, short circuits them, and annihilates them. Now, we're not in the Matrix now, we're in the real world. So he now has real power in the real world. This is because he has awoken to the true nature of himself, resurrected his care, understands part of the reason why we're in this situation, and now he's in a power to really affect change in the real world. Not just the machine world, not just the matrix, the world of illusion. He's really making change happen around him, physically now. Okay, That's what that represents. Another ship comes along the rest of them called the Hammer. Uh, very symbolic names. I'm not going to get too deep into them as well, but Nebuchadnezzar, the Hammer. I will talk about one of the ship names in part three, the Logos, which is the ship that uh, that um, Neo takes into the machine, the heart of the machine city. Uh, at the end of the film, this burst of energy coming from Neo puts him into a coma, suggesting that the high level of consciousness that he had to employ to do that, he, it burned him out. You know, he may, might not have been ready for it, or he may not have paced himself, and it ultimately put him into a temporary state of uh, being in a coma. So that's how the movie ends, with him being in a coma, and the, the ship's captains being debriefed on what happened at the first line of defense as the machines were trying to break through the defense lines into the city of Zion. They find that uh, someone blew an electromagnetic pulse weapon, which is the human's weapons against the machines, and did it prematurely, knocking out all the ships, and then the machines were able to swarm in and just annihilate the, the first line of defense of the city. So this is the guy who did it, and they found him unconscious, also in a coma like Neo, kind of, and his that was Bane, the Bane character, again. And we saw that uh, Smith took over earlier in the film. So really now, Smith's consciousness is embedded in this physical person named Bane in the real world, and the spirit of death and the virus of poison worldview and the poisoning of the heart and care is actually operating through this man, through his body in the, in the real world, and he's, he's actually right across from where Neo is at, the other health bay on the ship. That's how the movie ends. It's, it's a big cliffhanger. It's being continued. I was kind of horrified by that movie. I saw movie number two because I didn't even know it was going to be continued. I thought they were going to kind of wrap this one up. And, you know, when I saw it was going to be continued, I was quite frustrated. So let's move to the third movie. And this is how to get out of interest. This part is probably the least popular. And not only is it the least popular, it is most definitely the least understood of the three films. Let's jump in. Once again, sacred feminine in distress over 
Neo being in a coma over right action being dead, essentially, okay, still, and the hero still asleep at the beginning. These are the first times you see them in the film, and that's what's going on. Sacred Feminine still in distress, hero still asleep, the one still not really at his full potential. There's more that he has to wake up to, like what is required of us to really solve this problem. What is required is going to be discussed in this film. So they find out from the Oracle, who now looks different because part of her code was shut down by the Merovingian, but she moved into a new body within the Matrix. So she survived. She wasn't completely deleted. But the, the Merovingian was very upset. He controls codes that come in, uh, programs that come in and out of the Matrix. He was very upset that she, that she helped the main characters to get the Keymaker, because he did not want the Keymaker released. So we learn from the uh, Oracle that Neo has trapped in a place in his mind that is between the real world and the machine world. So he's not fully in the Matrix, but he's not in the real world either. He's somewhere in between. And that this construct is controlled by a program known as the Train Man. You see here, the Train Man, all right? And he works for the Merovingian, who follows his orders. So they want to lead a rescue mission into this, uh, into the Matrix to go back to the Merovingian and try to convince him to release uh, Neo from this construct controlled by the train man. This is described as um, a uh, black market of sorts for programs. Programs can make deals with the Merovingian, smuggle code in and out of the Matrix. One of the uh, programs wants to get his daughter out of the Matrix because he says he loves her. And Neo finds that so hard to believe. A program can love? And I think what that's representing is that even the agents of the Matrix, they have their reasons for doing what they're doing. These are ultimately justifications. But, you know, they say, well, I have a family. I have bills to pay. I, you know, I need to continue to do this. Someone needs to do it. I can make money doing it. And... You know, they believe that nonsense that this has to continue, this control system. And, you know, basically it's showing that they have underlying motivational reasons that could even be, uh, that could even be uh, related to love and attachment to people within their family and their, their circles. So finally, uh, with the help of Seraph again, Morpheus and Trinity go into the Matrix to try to get, uh, to try to make a bargain with the Merovingian. Well, what happens is the Merovingian tells him he wants the eyes of the Oracle, because he wants sight of the future. He wants to be all-knowing, which the controllers of this world want to do. They want to see things before it happens. They don't want to play the, the game of chess, honestly. You know, they want to control every function of the board so that the game is already, they know the outcome of the game before it's even played. That's what a reptilian mindset is all about. It's not about, it doesn't want any surprises. It wants 100% knowledge so that victor, their victory is assured. So what he's saying here is he wants the Oracle's eyes. He wants the knowledge of prophecy of the future, of what act everybody is going to make so he can come out on top. And Trinity holds, you know, finally holds a gun to his head saying, we can all go out here. I'm ready to die. I'll take you out. You can kill all of us. But, you know, I don't really care. But she's saying, I'm willing to lay my life down. And the Merovingian finally uh, does capitulate and releases Neo from the train man. Neo then, before they leave the Matrix, uh, wants to go back and see the Oracle. And this conversation is very important to the plot. The Oracle says to uh, Neo, she tells him that the architect told him what he told him because he is incapable of seeing past any choices because he doesn't understand choice. He is robotic consciousness. He's machine consciousness. He's left brain only consciousness that's divorced from any right brain uh, in, uh, intuition. So he doesn't have holistic intelligence. He can't really see the, the, the big patterns, the heuristic patterns. He can't see the forest for the trees. He can't even see the choices that are really right before him because he doesn't really understand choice or free will. He is totally deterministic. Okay, he's a machine mind. That's how a machine thinks. He says to him, choices are all variables in an equation. One at a time, linearly, 
a variable, a variable must be solved and counted. And that's how the left brain fits. He says that's his purpose, to balance the equations. It makes sense of reality and order and, you know, make constructs out of things. Okay? And Neo says, what's your purpose? And she says, the unbalance. Because she's the right brain aspect. She's the chaotic aspect. She's the intuitive aspect. She's the part that thinks heuristically and big picture thinking. All right? She can see intuitively into the future. She's non-linear time-based thinking, not time-bound awareness. Um, so her purpose is to unbalance that left brain side, to, to bring balance to it, in other words. The oracle then says, I see the end coming, the darkness spreading. I see death. And she's referring to Smith, the spreading of this virus within the, the entire world, within the matrix. She says, you are all that stands in his way. Very soon, he's going to have the power to destroy this world. But I believe he won't stop there. He can't. He won't stop until there's nothing left. Okay, so the desire to control death, the, the destruction of the heart energy, doesn't want to stop. This, this darkness wants to infest everything and it has consumed everything. <laughs> and he said, Neo says, what is he? Referring to Smith. And she says, he is your opposite. Your negative, because Neo represents light and the will for freedom, and Smith represents death, decay, entropy, darkness, and the will to enslave. Okay? So she says, he is the result of the equation trying to balance itself out. So Smith finally comes into the oracle and assimilates her, gaining her eyes. So now death, entropy, decay, actually has the, the vision and the foresight that it needs to move forward to really infest everything. So since we're talking about what these different programs within the matrix represent, I broke down to make this chart that breaks it all down. The architect of the matrix is the human ego, run for bulk, totally gone out of control, not checked whatsoever. And that's what's putting us deeper and deeper into the control system. He is left brain dominance, pure left brain, as I've been talking about. He is also the R complex because when we're in a left brain form of imbalance, the executive command functions all get go get uh, shunted and get rooted within the R complex, which is our base brain, our reptile mind. And that's why controllers all act like reptiles. It's all about me, 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 what I can get, what I can afford, and screw everybody else. Okay. It's about the desire for control. That's the architect of the matrix. That's what got us into this mess. It is the deterministic aspect of creation. I'd say it's the deterministic aspect of thinking, really. All right? It's determinism. It's what the, the architect represents. No wavering, no free will, no choice. Hard-lined approach. Okay? The oracle represents the human intuition. She is right brain dominance. So you can look at that as new age beliefs that don't include the negative or you know, are way outside time-bound awareness, but they, there's not really balance there either. Okay? She, she could be interpreted as the midbrain or the limbic brain, the limbic system. She represents prophecies, seers, new age belief systems, and she is the randomness aspect, the non-linear, non-time-bound aspect of our ourselves, our mind. The Merovingian, again, he represents the dark occultist, the satanic aspect within creation. The opposer, don't look at this as just a mythical character here. We're talking about the force that divides us from within ourselves. Satan in the original Hebrew language means the adversary, the one who opposes, the one who divides. It's divisive consciousness. It's me first only consciousness. Um, carnality and base desires being all you care about. You want to feed the beast, okay? It's manipulation and deception to get what you want. That's what he represents. So the dark opus, the quote in Illuminati, the dark Illuminati, the powers that be in our world. Smith, of course, represents fear and death, spreading everywhere like a plague, like a virus, like a black cancer to infest the heart. He is poisoning sickness, disease. That's why he goes into Bane. Bane means poison. It means the agent of death. He's a virus that is infecting us. He is darkness, decay, entropy, the breakdown, ultimately at a grand scale, he's cataclysm, being driven by imbalanced consciousness. 
All right? Those are the programs within the matrix. So, finally, uh, the captains are discussing their strategy because they're kind of stranded outside the city of Zion. They're trying to get back in so that they can help the war effort because the machines are rapidly approaching. And in the middle of them making plans, all very, you know, left brain, what are we going to do type plans, Neo barges into the room and says, I know what I have to do. Okay, here's what he says. He says, <clears throat> he says, I know what I have to do. I need to take one of the two ships that are left, take it by myself, and take it to the machine mainframe, the machine city. And they're, they look in like he's completely mad, like he's completely insane. What he's saying is, I have to take this consciousness and bring it into the heart of the enemy. I have to get it into the heart of the people who are ultimately still powering the control system. And they're looking at him like he's completely mad. You have no weapons. Where are you going to do yourself? No ship has ever gotten within 100 kilometers of the machine's defenses. And you're going to do it with one ship yourself. They'd say it's a waste. You're committing suicide. Even Morpheus doesn't really speak up in his very hesitant questioning of Neo. Finally, Morpheus's old girlfriend, Niobe, one of the captains as well, says, you can have my ship. And when Morpheus says, why are you doing that? You never believed in the prophecy of the one. You know, she says, I still don't. I believe in him. I believe in Neo. I believe in his power to affect change. I don't need to believe in a prophecy. Okay? So <clears throat> she gives him her ship and lets him take it with Trinity into the heart of the uh, machine world, the machine city. Meanwhile, uh, on the other ship, Bane uh, woke from his coma and killed the uh, um, medic on the other ship. And he now goes onto the ship uh, and hides there uh, the ship that Neo and Trinity are going to take to the machine mainframe. He's going to try to stop them, of course. Okay, and that ship is called the Logos, which we'll get to in a moment. So Bane is now on board the Logos, and he's holding Trinity capital again. He represents Smith, which represents death, and the destruction of care, and he's holding the sacred feminine captive. All right, Neo tries to rescue her, and he is blinded by Bane. Bane shoves an exposed cable, electrical cable into Neo's face and burns his eyeballs in. And he actually burns away his eyes. So Neo is now blind, and Bane calls him the blind Messiah. He calls it, his sight to the physical five sense world is now gone. He's not relying anymore on physical senses. He's relying on his spiritual senses. He's relying on higher sight to see the world around him. And he's not just looking at things from a five sense perspective. Now, just like he could see the code within the matrix with a higher form of consciousness, he could see the things that are going on in the real world, in the real world, just as they are. So he sees this, you know, demon consciousness in vain, which is Smith having you know, Steph and having you. And he finally does dispatch Bane. And they continue on their way to the machine city. Uh, meanwhile, on Zion, the troops are per, uh, preparing to, um, to do battle with the machines. And they're all very hesitant and very nervous because they don't think many of them are going to survive if any of them at all. So, the battle finally begins when the machine consciousness breaches the defenses of Zion. And comes into the city like a swarm of locusts, annihilating everything. Their numbers are too great. And this is suggested that the numbers of the people who are still totally attached to the system of control in our world and will give over all of their energy and their bodies for the perpetuation of that control are still so overwhelmingly vast that it is like we are literally up against a plague of locusts. Ah. And that's what that represents. That so few are woken up to the evil of their actions that they will do the bidding of the machine consciousness full bore, no matter what it means, even if it means the destruction of humanity. Okay. 
So Niobe pilots the ship through the mechanical pipes leading back into the, the city of Zion, and they explode an electromagnetic pulse weapon, which gives them a little bit of breathing room. It destroys enough machines to give them some breathing room. During the aftermath, there's a conversation between Neo and the council members. And he says that Neo is doing what he believes he must do. In other words, he has found his true purpose. He's doing what he thinks he, he believes he really needs to be doing. He's doing his work. He now knows that this is what work he needs to do, and he's finally doing Beating, taking that understanding of consciousness and bringing it into the machine world, bringing it into the mind and heart of the people who are still in that diseased level of consciousness to help to change them. That's what Neo is finally doing, which is what his purpose is. He says, I don't know, Morpheus is saying about Neo, I don't know if he'll reach the machine city. And if he does, I don't know what he can do to save us. But I do know that as long as there is a single breath in his body, he will not give up, and neither can we. And this is the main message of the third move point that what it's going to take to get us out of this current condition of humanity is sustained will power, sustained effort, not giving up, not just expecting results quickly, and if they don't happen, then just saying, oh, it didn't work. Sustained will power is what is required in order to solve this problem. Okay? Let's move on. Neo and Trinity approach the machine city. I wish you could see it a little bit clearer in this slide, but there are three main pipes that lead from the power plants that all, all the people are plugged into, giving their energy, and they're, it's leading to the machine city, which is very far away from the power plants. This represents something very profound. There are three channels. There are three forms of energy that the machine consciousness is feeding on through us. And that is our thoughts, our emotions, and our actions. They feed on mental energy, us giving our thoughts over to their way of thinking and their worldview. Our emotions, they want to wire our emotions up into a bowl and have us pump out all negative energy so they can feed on that. And our actions, we give our physical energy over to the machine world. Okay, to the control system. There's machines there that are unimaginably enormous and seemingly what is Neo going to do up against something that powerful? Well, ultimately he can stop these a lot of these machines just by holding up his hand. So many of them swarm at him that he feels that he's almost overwhelmed. And he says, uh, there are way too many sentinels, I can't beat them. So even with his level of consciousness, there's so many people attached and plugged into this control system, I don't know how we're going to beat them. Finally, he says, we can't beat them head on, so go up, go over them. And this is, again, representative of this concept that's brought out as a motif going up. They go up into the clouds above the dark energies. So this is rising up to a higher level of consciousness, and in doing so, you're going over that low consciousness. You are transcending it, and you can actually you know, work with it from that higher perspective to, to try to change what's going on down there. So he says, go up, go over them. The sky is the only way. I'm going to wrap it up fairly soon. The Logos then crashes on re-entry into the dark uh, aspects of the atmosphere. This is very symbolic. Logos is a Greek word that means word. The word. Okay? Now, what did we say the most powerful word was? Ultimately, the lost word is no. And that's what this ship represents. It represents saying no, crashing, saying no, failing. But when we say, when we, not enough of us say no to the control system, then the word has crashed. The word has been blown apart because we're not saying no, the most powerful word. And that represents the death of care because Trinity dies when the Logos crashes. So ultimately, not saying no 
The refusal to disengage from the desire to control is the death of the heart. That's what this is saying, symbolically, allegorically. That's when she dies, when finally the word crashes. Neo says goodbye to Trinity, and now there's only one recourse. Because saying no has failed, now a sacrifice is required. So this is what's going to happen if we don't say no. That a sacrifice is going to be required, as it once was before, and I would suggest was many times before, but it's going to be required again. We don't want to have that eventuality happen. We're trying to avert that, ultimately, by going up over them, okay? Going to the sky and changing consciousness. But if it has to be done through a sacrifice, then it will be, and a small portion will fight for the whole. So Neo says to Deus Ex Machina, which is the God out of the machine, which is what this big machine, it's the hive mind of the machine world. That's what it represents. You know, the totally diseased consciousness of the intellect divorced from care and wisdom and out of control and ultimately trying to dominate everything. He says to it, the program Smith, this virus, has grown beyond even your control. In other words, death is going to destroy everything, okay? You're, you're not even going to survive this, you know, to control anything. You're going to have a world of complete annihilation and cataclysm left, you know, that you're going to rule. You're not even going to rule it. You're going to get swept up in that hard uh, uh, cataclysmic outcome. He says, Smith has grown beyond your control, and soon he will even spread through this city as he has spread through the Matrix. You can't stop him, but I can. So he tries to make a deal with the machine mind and says, I'll take care of the Smith problem if you will agree to free Zion, not destroy Zion. So the machines ask him, what do you want? And he says, I want peace. Okay, so he's the bringer of peace. He's trying to negotiate a, uh, a um, stand down between the machines and humanity. So the machines plug him into the matrix through their mainframe, through the machine mainframe. And when they do that, he's going to go in to fight Smith for the machine world. And the machines now stand down in the city of Zion. And no one knows why they're standing down. Morpheus, however, recognizes that this is something that Neo is doing, and he puts his weapon down first. He's the first person to lay down his weapon because he's saying, I'm willing to give peace a chance. I'm willing to mm -hmm. try to take the route of higher consciousness to Neo. Okay? So Neo goes into the Matrix to fight Smith. All the other Smiths line up to watch it because the one Smith who he's going to fight says, I have the eyes of the Oracle. I know everything. I know how this is going to turn out which is very arrogant of him because he doesn't see, he doesn't really recognize that Neo's plugged into the machine mainframe. So the machine, the machines, the mainframe have access to this virus now. What does is, what is, um, Smith do? He assimilates people. He goes into them, becomes them. They become him, should it say, okay? So ultimately, in this fight, what Neo's gonna allow to happen is Smith to go into him so that the machines can locate the virus and eradicate it. Right, And in the middle of the fight, when it's looking totally hopeless for Neo, and Smith drives him from the sky like a, um, a meteor, like a comet, into the Earth, and opens up a huge crater and a big blast of energy, it, uh, Neo still gets up. He still gets up for more punishment. And uh, Smith asks him, why? Why get up? Why keep on fighting? You can't win. You can't possibly win. What you're doing is pointless. It is pointless to keep fighting. Why do you persist? And the response that Neo gives is because I choose to. Free will. Sustained will power. It doesn't matter if the, old, the actual physical change isn't going to be seen in your lifetime. I don't care about that. I'm going to continue fighting evil regardless of what happens because I choose to, because it's the right thing, and that's what I'm going to spend my energy doing, the end. And it doesn't matter if one single other individual lifts a finger, I'll do that until I can't draw breath. Now, that's how we're going to get out of the matrix. 
come up to that level of awareness and consciousness and will our, and then we'll have a chance and probably not a minute before. So that's the answer of how to get out of the matrix. It may require sacrifice, even giving everything you have, then we'll have a chance. So finally, he allows Smith to absorb him, go into him. And in doing so, since he is still connected to the machine mainframe, now through this act of sacrifice, the machines can locate Smith and exterminate his program. And that's what they do. He is blown up in another shower of in, in, immense white light. But this time, when he blows up, all of them blow up, all of the copies, and it blows up in the shape of a cross. Yeah. Because this is about sacrifice. This is about completely giving of oneself in a, in a messianic act, okay? An act of willingness to save others. So this brings us to what is the actual character's name in the Matrix world, Veen, Anderson, Ander, man, son, the son of man. He is the Christ figure. He is the savior figure, the messianic figure. And when, when he dies in the Matrix, they show a cross right on his chest, and he's in a shower of golden light. He's the Christ consciousness. Neo is the embodiment of Christ consciousness and the willingness to give everything to create a change in the world. That's what he is. And you see the final position that his body ends up with in the machine world in, in a shape of a position of crucifixion. So that is what Anderson ultimately represents symbolically. In doing this, the machines broker a peace between them and the humans. And um, the war ends. The war between the machine consciousness and humanity is over. Uh, this is announced to the people of Zion. They rejoice that the war is finally over and they can move on with their lives. The final scene is between a conversation between the Oracle program, who now comes back into the Matrix. She is resurrected as well after having been absorbed by Smith and the architect. And... The Oracle character says to the architect, well, the people of Zion are free, but what about the others? What about the people who are still connected to the Matrix, these power plants in the Matrix? She says, what's going to happen to them, the ones that want out? And the architect has brokered a deal because of what Neo has done for the machines by eradicating spit. See, it's about he has conquered death. That's another concept of the Messiah or the Christ. He's conquered death. He is light. He conquers darkness. So in, in an act of sacrifice, that light energy has conquered the dark. And the answer that the architect gives is, is the profound ending message of the, the whole series, the whole trilogy. He says to the oracle that the ones that won out will be freed. That is the final message of the architect in the film. He says, obviously, they will be free. So in other words, the desire to want to get out of the system of control is where it has to all start. And that's where it will start for other people who have not yet seen the truth, but if they want it badly enough, they will be free at some future point. And that's the message of hope that the trilogy concludes with. However, there is one other question that is what the whole trilogy is ultimately about. And I'm going to wrap up with this question and I'll leave you with it. And that is, ultimately, not even allegorically or symbolically, but in the real world, the question of this trilogy is, in the real world, who is the one? And the answer is... You are. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.